When we talk about precision feeding, we're simply saying targeting the right amount of nutrients to uh, each individual cow. And of course, perhaps the best example is precision feeding our robotic feeders, in which we actually dictate or give the cows a variable amount of concentrates while they're being milked in the robotic feeders. Welcome to Rumination, the podcast that offers practical solutions to meet the needs of our dairy industry today. Hi, this is Chris Gwynn. I'm your host, and today I'm today I'm honored to be visiting with Dr. Mike Hutchins of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Hutchins, of course, is world renowned for his ability to synthesize research down to a practical level that uh, is really take-home messages for the dairy producer. How do we utilize this day to day at the farm level? And that's has often been his key to success. And while we're talking here today, with that in mind, it's no surprise to realize that Dr. Hutchins has received numerous awards for research, for extension, and for it overall distinguished service to the dairy industry. So, congratulations, Dr. Hutchins, on that. For the last 18 months, for sure, you've heard one of his many presentations he's done online, in particular with his ongoing series with Hordes Dairman. And what's interesting to note today, working with the Santa Fe Institute in Brazil, working on some dairy production training modules in multiple languages. So congratulations on that, Dr. Hutchins, and welcome to Rumination. Thank you very much, Chris. It's an honor to be on the program today. Well, and it's on our honor as well to have you here. So today we wanted to dig down deeper into dry matter intake. Um, obviously, dry matter intake is essential for the dairy cow to be productive and profitable and healthy. And I'm just wondering, has the, the take or the interest in dry matter intake changed over the years, especially in the light of discussions about feed efficiency? In short, are there times where we're okay that she remains healthy productive and actually eats a little bit less. Could you expand on that? Sure can, Chris. Cer certainly that's the goal on, on dairy farms. We want to make sure that we have healthy cows. Uh, so, so dry matter plays an important role on, on animal health and immunity. We got to get cows pregnant in a timely manner because that determines uh, a peak milk production and phase feeding on, on dairy farms as well. And so dry matter has is, is become a, a, an interesting topic because efficiency of dry matter uh, is, is we're kind of late in the dairy situation. It was a very big topic with swine and poultry. And some of us asked, well, why can't we do that for dairy cows? And now we're doing that. So certainly things have changed over time. Uh, we used to call them maximizing dry matter. Now we're optimizing dry matter because we can we don't want to overfeed uh, dry matter because that will cost me money and yet we still have to meet the cow's requirements and so if I can get more milk per kilo of dry matter uh, that's going to save me some money as well. Uh, another concept of course is mar we call it marginal dry matter. Marginal dry matter is that last mouthful of feed the cow consumes because she will do that very efficiently because she no longer has to maintain her body weight. She doesn't have to take some of her nutrients for walking, for growth and factors like that. So a lot of new interest twists on dry matter intake and feed efficiency. So with that in mind, maybe talk to the audience about what you see as the key drivers to dry matter intake. Well, Chris, I, I like to say there, there are four of them. And let's, let's start out with the, 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 the basic one. And that basically is going to be what we call a fill factor. In other words, cows, much like humans, can only eat so much feed in a 24 hour period of time. And so once we've met that, and that's usually determined by NDF digestibility and undigestibility, we, we then, we have to say, well, if we have too much straw or too much low quality forage, then the cow can't eat to what she really has to have. The second one that we call a Metabolic feedback it simply means that uh, something tells the cow to stop eating. Examples would be ruminacidosis. Uh, another one would be too much propionic acid going into the, the bloodstream, and she can sense that in her in her satiety or brain center. Too much fat in the diet, certainly. So that's why we we balance rations. The third one will be what we call non-nutrient factors. In other words, it says uh, something in her environment stops her eating. Heat stress, and I think our listeners can understand that when it gets very, very hot, your appetite isn't as strong as it would be, or if it's really, really cold, it might stimulate the appetite. Another factor for cows would be late 
lameness. They just don't want to walk to the feed bunk because they have sore hooves as far as that goes. Empty feed bunk. There, there is no feed in the feed bunk. There's no food on the table. And obviously you can't eat unless there's food on the table. And the last one, Chris, is going to be transition management uh, and how okay. we take cows through the transition program. And so if we don't have a good uh, close or fresh cow program with key feed additives and B vitamins, that can affect dry matter intake as well. No, thank you for that and, and reminding us how important it is to, to me- be measuring and, and taking into consideration those aspects. So when we talk about monitoring dry matter intake, and you've traveled around the world, can you share some great examples of farms where they were just doing a great job in, in measuring and monitoring dry matter intake to optimize that feed efficiency or production? Yeah, Chris, I'll give you two examples, and, and you can expand on that as you, our listeners listen to this. The first one actually is here in the Midwest. One of our very top herds here in the Midwest, they have 3,600 dairy cows, and he basically knows exactly how much dry matter goes to each pen because he has 10 pens on the farm, which typically about 400 cows in a pen, uh, except for his, his sick cow pen and and and. His his young cow pens or pre-fresh pens. And, and so he every day he knows exactly how much dry matter going because that's on the computer on his truck. Now in the milking parlor, they got a flow meter. So every day he knows exactly how many pounds of milk comes out of that pen of 400 cows. So every day he gets a feed efficiency calculation on each pen in uh, on his farm and 10 pens each day. And he's told me then what he does through, then it does a weekly average of those seven values to see trends. So if if, if the high cow pen is going down in dry matter, then he has to explore why is it going down in dry matter intake. Or if it's going up, why is it going up and is milk going up with it to track right along with it. So that's a great example that not many farmers can do that. Now he gets away with that because he feeds to an empty bunk. So there is no way back. So it makes a simple, it maybe simplifies his, his feeding approach. Now he and I have argued over a glass of skim milk on that and I always lose because I always like to have a little bit of feed left over over so that cow that wants that extra bite that extra marginal dry matter can eat it even a better example was when i happened to be in saudi arabia about 15 or 16 years ago and there that was an 8,000 cow dairy herd and there they feed feed 24 7 so there's always a feed wagon going around and as each group of cows is uh being milked uh, they call him the bunk reader. And that person, I rode with him for about, uh, about four or five hours. And it was pretty amazing. Uh, he would look at that. There's about 2% less. And he could just eyeball that. And after I watched him, even I could do that. And so then he would say it was 2% less. Then they'd come in and scoop that out. And then he would call back to the feeder and says, okay, I want you to drop in X amounts, X kilograms of feed. So if there was a excess of amount of feed, he would feed less the next, uh, uh, for the next time. And since there was such a big herd, they were milking cows 24 seven. And so, uh, these, uh, units were operating all the time. So certainly I, I think those are great examples. Probably not most of our listeners can do that, but it simply shows how you try to get good data and to enhance dry matter intake. Well, certainly the software on TMR systems to monitor what's being dropped and what's being uh, mixed and and dry matters thereof can be more and more effectively measured each and every day. So the technology is certainly arriving for us to take advantage of. Yeah, and Chris, maybe I should add one more thing. There's uh, there's a new technology coming uh, in there in California and Michigan right now in which they install cameras in the barn. And and a camera takes a a, a global picture uh, every few minutes as far as that goes. And so uh, the camera then summarizes that with a computer and it can show to you which feed bunks are empty, when they go empty, when the next feed comes in, and when they're pushing it up. So that technology is here now. And so some of our our more modest-sized farm can actually use those technologies to enhance uh, feed delivery. No, absolutely. We're going to be making leaps and bounds in that area. I know in previous podcast versions, we've talked about technology and how to take advantage of it and, and locating cows at the bunk and lying down to determine what's going on through the day will really help us in particular in this area of measuring feed efficiency and, and then coming up with uh, measuring our carbon footprint in the future. One of the points that I wanted to expand on, and, and you had mentioned it on on drivers of dry matter intake, but one of the, and, and you just talked in some of your farm examples about the communication of reading the bunk and back to the feeder and what that can cost us if one, we're out on our dry matter percentages in our forages, but then if we're also inaccurate in our cow numbers in a pen 
And could you expand a bit on both those? I, I sure can, Chris. Uh, obviously, uh, feed efficiency is, is looking at the kilos of dry matter uh, consumed. So that's why the way back has to be not counted in there. By uh, Divide that into the kilos of milk or pounds, depending on which uh, system you're using here. And so uh, it's on a per cow basis. So if I have uh, an extra three or four cows, uh, for example, in this herd uh, that we were just talking about, 400 cows in a pen, if he had an extra six or seven cows, then obviously uh, we're going to divide that with the wrong uh, number. And therefore that number will be incorrect out there and our feed efficiency number will shift as well. And of course, the other one is just moisture. It rains, it snows, uh, silages get wetter and drier. Byproduct feeds get wetter or drier. And as a result, that too can change. So if I'm delivering, for example, 23 kilos of dry matter each day, and now I've got an extra kilogram of water in there or some fraction thereof, then obviously that changes what the cow is really going to consume. And in many cases, there's some work out of Wisconsin in which they actually track that after significant rainfalls. And these cows, for because they didn't adjust the amount of wet feed being added in the silages, these cows went down in milk production for three or four days. And in some cases, uh, some of these cows in mid-late lactation, they don't come back. Once they drop, uh, they don't come back. So yeah. certainly uh, the dry matter content of the ration and the number of cows become important to calculate that number to be sure we're getting the right, uh, the right answers. And again, there's technology available today that more effectively or more easily measures dry matter in dry matter of forages and maybe something that a lot of farms need to consider more in working with their feeder to determine, are we following the diet? Are we got the right dry matters that are going into it? Some great points. Yeah, and Chris, let me Thank add you. to that. I, I think uh, if I had a, a 500 cow dairy herd or a 50 cow dairy herd, I think you got to check dry matters in the total mix ration once a week. And if it's a big herd, wow. Ohio State says perhaps two or three times a week, check the dry matter of the TMR because if that starts changing, then you got to go back and say, well, which feed ingredients are changing that causes that shift to occur? In in the world of tighter and tighter margins as we go forward, these are the little things that can make a difference. Dr. Hutchins, earlier you talked about um, precision feeding, and I wanted, if you could span a bit about how we can utilize precision feeding on a dairy with maybe encouraging more multiple group feeding to improve feed efficiency and how that plays in with dry matter intake. You are exactly right, Chris. When we talk about precision feeding, we're simply saying targeting the right amount of nutrients to uh, each individual cow. And of course, perhaps the best example is precision feeding our robotic feeders, in which we actually dictate or give the cows a very low amount of concentrates while they're being milked in the robotic feeder. So we're trying to match up her requirements to what she's going to be fed. So robotic feeders, which are becoming more and more popular, even on bigger farms, certainly would be a another tool we could have. As you mentioned, grouping cows. So in other words, if I can have a group of cows that are averaging 50 kilos of milk and feed them a, a different diet than those cows that are producing 45 or 40, those tail end cows at 30 kilos of milk, obviously I can make those adjustments in the ration so more of my cows in that group are targeted with the amounts of metabolizable protein, NDF, starch, uh, feed additives, and, and stuff like that in the, in the feeding program. And so that's going to become more and more important, especially as we start looking at uh, feed costs and greenhouse gases because we know precision feeding would allow me to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from these cows. Now, it's a fascinating topic and we could probably go on and on for several hours just talking about these things. You're a wealth of knowledge, so thank you for sharing that. So today for the audience in relation to dry matter intake in dairy cows, could you maybe give us some take-home messages of the sort of things that you would recommend a dairy producer today to get ahead on or a handle on dry matter intake and how it impacts feed efficiency. Uh, I sure can, Chris. Uh, my first take home message is number one, you got to measure it. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So uh, every dairy farmer should come to a dairy meeting and tell me my feed efficiency is 1.46 or 1.52 or whatever the case is. You've just got to measure that and then adjust that based on where we are in uh, on his dairy farm. Uh, number two, we know that feed efficiency has an economic impact. 
when we start looking at uh, dry matter costs here in uh, Illinois at 12 cents per pound of dry matter, uh, a pound of dry matter, uh, and if I can change my feed efficiency to 1.4 to 1.5, uh, that feed efficiency is going to make me about an extra 24 cents profit profitability out there in, in the program. And, and then, of course, certainly, as we mentioned earlier, uh, take-home messages, uh, we're going to see a new efficiency coming, Chris, and that's going to be called protein efficiency. Uh, in other words, how much protein am I feeding? How much milk protein am I capturing? And we want to try to get that number up over 35%. So the question is, most farmers aren't even doing that yet, but that will be coming in the, in, in the future as well as we look uh, down the road. Oh, that's fascinating, and, and thank you. I, there'll be some more discussions we'll have to have on protein, but protein efficiency absolutely makes a lot of sense to look deep into that. So thank you again for those take-homes. And with that in mind, I just wanted to thank you and draw the podcast to a close. Thank you, Dr. Hutchins, for sharing with us. My pleasure. You have a good day. And I surely want to thank our audience for listening to us. And so that you don't miss our next episode of Rumination Podcast, you can find us at jeffo.ca or on Apple, Google Podcasts, as well as Spotify. This podcast was brought to you by Jeffo Nutrition, Inc., Precision Nutrition for a Growing World.